webinar, I'm pleased to be joined by Laura Gibbons from the Hackett Group. And Hackett uh, is certainly uh, the preeminent uh, benchmarking and advisory firm in the procurement space, so particularly well suited to address today's topic, which, which I think is very exciting for everyone in procurement. Uh, as, a, as a group, I think procurement is extremely goal-oriented, but, but also as a group not necessarily focused on self-promotion, on building that brand, um, that brand equity and brand image, especially amongst various stakeholder groups within the enterprise. So a very exciting topic for you today. And just before we get into it, I'll cover a couple of quick housekeeping notes. On the WebEx uh, platform, for example, you have different uh, dialog boxes, uh, for instance, for Q&A. So please feel free as we go through the webinar today to log in any questions that you'd like uh, Laura or myself to address on our topic, and uh, we'll, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can get to. In terms of connecting uh, for the, the webcast, you have a couple of options, um, either to uh, connect through your computer or to dial in. So anyone who's on the WebEx but not dialed into the audio portion yet, uh, please feel free to avail yourself of that to, to make sure that you join us for the, the talk track as well. Uh, another question that comes up frequently, of course, is uh, getting access to all of the content. And at the end of the, the webinar today, we'll, we'll show you um, uh, how, how that's going to be dealt with. Uh, you'll get an email within 24 hours that will give you links to both the, uh, the slide deck as well as a recording of the session. So just before we get into the actual agenda, a quick word about Zykus to provide a little bit of context. We are exclusively focused on the procurement and sourcing space as an integrated suite provider of software tools that cover both the strategic aspects of procurement from spend analytics, e-sourcing, contract and supplier management as an example, as well as the more operational components such as procure to pay, and, and tracking savings through financial savings management. Let me tell you a little bit about our, our featured speaker today. Laura Gibbons is the research director in the Procurement Executive Advisory Program for the Hackett Group, and she has extensive industry and consulting experience in areas such as purchase to pay, strategic sourcing, payment strategies, manufacturing operations, economic impact analysis, and organizational and process design. And before her current role at Hackett Group, uh, she was in the strategy and operations consulting practice where she specialized in sourcing, procurement, and supply chain, and was in a similar role, strategy and operations at Groupon before joining the Hackett Group. And, and uh, a little bit of background about me as well. Uh, one of your panelists here, I'm the VP of Corporate Development at Zykus and uh, spent a long time at uh, GE uh, prior to, to that earlier in my career. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to Laura to really talk about this, this whole area of rebranding the procurement organization. Laura? Great. Thank you, Richard. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. Uh, so thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here today. We are going to talk about branding the procurement organization. So like Richard was saying, um, starting to self-promote the organization. So before we get there, let's talk about what it means to be a trusted advisor because that's really what branding is going to get you. It's going to get you to elevate the procurement organization to become a trusted advisor to your stakeholders. Originally, when we, we asked this question uh, as part of our stakeholder survey, what capabilities will help the most for procurement organizations to become a trusted advisor? And when we first started talking about this, we expected to hear things like innovation, um, delivering high quality market insights. A lot of that, you know, very next level um, strategic type of activities. But when we talked to stakeholders, we found that what they were really looking for was for procurement to consistently deliver the basics and do it with high caliber staff. Okay. 
Um, so just an example of another company that's, that's done something like this really well. Um, and this isn't a procurement specific example, but it's one that everyone should know. UPS about uh, 15, 20 years ago uh, wasn't doing so well, was struggling a lot with the competition, um, having a hard time keeping up with uh, the demands to meet global needs. So they underwent a very large and successful rebranding campaign. And they did a few of the few things that we're gonna talk about today. Um, and they did them really well. So the first one is creating that logo. They've got the simple color palette, it's brown, it's gold, and it's the shield that everyone knows. They use it consistently, it's everywhere, so it's very recognizable. Another thing that they did was really focus on meeting their customers' needs. So they're very reliable. I know that I can walk into a UPS store, drop off a package and a label, and walk out. I don't have to see them tape it up. I don't need my receipt. I know that it's gonna get where it needs to go because UPS has branded themselves and delivered on those promises to be a trusted partner to me. So I feel comfortable using them. I'm gonna to continue to do business with them. Um, you know, I trust them. So those are some of the things that we're gonna talk about um, how to get your procurement organization to achieve um, those, those things. All right, we're also gonna do a few polls today. If we can just get that poll loaded up. Uh, in the bottom right corner, you'll see a poll pop up in your WebEx. Um, you can just click one of those and hit submit. So the question is, do you feel that your procurement organization has a recognizable brand with stakeholders? Yes or no? So like we talked about with UPS, is there is there a logo? Does procurement have that sort of persona, um, something that's recognizable with your stakeholders um, for them to identify with? So while folks are weighing in, Laura, I'd be curious, just, just from your experience, um, do, you, do you think most pre procurement organizations are more likely to say that they have a recognizable brand, you know, that the, the stakeholders really understand what the procurement function delivers and, and what that brand stands for, or, or do you think it's less likely? Um, you know, we've done this poll a couple of times, and the, the results sort of hover around 50-50 uh, with respondents. I think that they're more or less accurate. We tend to think that people are gonna, you know, um, believe that their brand is a little bit more recognizable than it, than it really is, but 50-50 is probably not that far off from the reality. Um, this is something that a lot of organizations are already kind of starting to do. Well, that, that was pretty prescient, I think, your, your prediction there. It looks like it did come in close to 50-50. Yep. Uh, any, any comments or surprises? Nope, that's about what I would expect. So um, you guys said that 45% of you said that, yes, um, you do feel that your procurement organization has a recognizable brand and 55% said no. So what we'll talk about today is, you know, for those of you that aren't there yet, you know, how you can get started, and then for those of you that already do have that recognizable brand, um, we're gonna talk about some different examples and ideas and, and different things to help you um, really elevate, um, elevate that brand. Okay, what does this mean for procurement? Uh, if you look at the, um, the value pyramid here, um, we are talking about getting the role of procurement up to the top, um, the value management section, where you are a trusted business advisor, um, stakeholders are coming to you early in the process, and you're really working together with them in a partnership to help deliver um, and create more value for the business. Okay, so um, this is, again, part of our stakeholder survey, so the, the current role of procurement in supporting business success. If you look at the bottom there, the peer group, just 16% of procurement organizations are viewed as that valued business partner, so that top part of the pyramid that we just looked at. Um, you can see uh, 34, 35% are the negotiations um, 
or sourcing expert, so almost there but not quite. And then still about 50% of procurement organizations are viewed as an administrator or a gatekeeper. So these are the ones, uh, you know, the folks that don't have that recognizable brand yet. Um, stakeholders just view, view them as, as a purchasing organization um, or something that's a little bit less strategic, not in that partnership manner that we're looking for. Okay, again, we're looking at the same uh, four different types of um, ways to view procurement, administrator, gatekeeper, um, all the way up to valued business partner. And here we're looking at savings for each of those organizations. So for the administrators, about 2.3% 2, 2 savings. And as you go up that curve for valued business partner, we're all the way up to 4.7%, so you've doubled savings. So this, this really just shows that the closer uh, the relationship you have with stakeholders, the better you're able to work together um, and really become uh, part of a partnership. So we're able to create more value. So what's preventing organizations from taking this role of a trusted advisor? We've grouped these, uh, these different reasons into three buckets. The first one is historical performance is difficult to change. So maybe, you know, procurement for, you know, the last 10 plus years has just been there for purchasing. Um, the customers aren't used to um, sourcing help, negotiations help, um, all of those additional benefits that, that procurement is now able to do. So it's, it's this past history where customers don't have that trust in procurement. Um, so they're, they're basing all their perceptions off of the history. Um, this also means that you know, maybe the staff isn't trained up to help deliver what procurement is intending to deliver. The second bucket, stakeholders are unaware of what procurement can offer. So maybe the procurement organization has already undergone this transformation. They're ready to deliver um, all of the activities and services that the customers are looking for, but they haven't communicated that. There's no um, internal portal for procurement to list all their services. There's no email communication, no newsletters, none of those activities going on for procurement to communicate with stakeholders. And then the third one, the procurement organization is undergoing a transformation. So this one's about uncertainty. Maybe there's a change in leadership or a recent merger or acquisition. Um, something like this is causing the procurement organization um, to have a transformation, and this, this causes sort of a state of influx um, in the eyes of stakeholders. Okay, and we're going to do another poll now. Um, this one is about the last slide, so what are can we go ahead and, and load that poll? Um, so this poll question is, um, we're looking to understand, you know, what's making it difficult for you in your organization? The question is, what are the biggest challenges of elevating procurement's role to that of a trusted advisor? A procurement organization is undergoing a large transformation. Stakeholders are unaware of what procurement can offer. Historical performance is difficult to change, or none of these. And I think that you can choose multiple there, but if not, go ahead and just choose the one that's most applicable. All right, it looks like the poll question is closed. This is my, my favorite part of the WebEx is while these are loading. And again, I'll ask you for a quick prediction, mm -hmm. Laura, you know, and I guess offer one of my own. Do you think in most cases it's just that, you know, stakeholders may simply not be aware of what procurement can offer? They may not really yeah. see the historical or even know if there's a transformation, but they just don't know what procurement uh, yeah. brings to the table. I would expect to see a little bit of B and C. Yeah. Or, you know, higher percentages of B and C, and then a little bit less of A. Yep, so 
So it looks like 41% said that stakeholders are unaware of what procurement can offer. Um, and then historical per performance is about 31%, and the transformation, um, 28%. Okay. Yeah, so again, that's, that's um, similar to what we've seen in the past. Um, and, and that really makes you know, today's conversation um, very important, right? Because if your stakeholders don't know what you can offer, um, we're going to talk about how we can communicate procurement um, capabilities. All right. Okay, so let's get started talking about the four steps to procurement rebranding. And I'm going to start this, this section by covering a question that people have asked us. So why don't we just get marketing involved or, you know, have them do this for us? So there's a couple of reasons why that doesn't work. Um, one is because marketing, of course, has other things to do. Um, and rebranding the procurement organization isn't at the top of their list. But two, you know, we're not recreating the wheel here. We're, we're covering four fairly simple steps for procurement to um, understand what you're offering and communicate that to stakeholders and then keep them engaged. So we can sort of simplify this and utilize the resources that are already in your organization do these things on your own. Um, you know, it, it, it's simple and, and we don't, like I said, need to recreate the, the wheel. You can leverage some of the branding concepts of the enterprise organization even, um, just to kind of fine tune things and, and give them a spin um, for procurement. The four steps, um, number one, understand the key areas of importance for internal customers. Two, define the details of processes and the new role of procurement. Three, create marketing materials and release initial communications. Four, engage and communicate with stakeholders on an ongoing basis. All right, so that first one, understanding the key areas of importance for your internal customers and stakeholders. So when you start the process, the first thing to do is to understand what do my stakeholders want from what are they looking for? Do they need help with spot buying? Are they looking for negotiation support, market intelligence? Do they need on-demand reporting capabilities, somewhere that they can just go and log into a dashboard and get their numbers you know, real time? Are they looking for supplier identification? Um, you know, is it a partnership that they're looking for? So. Here we want to understand what's important to the stakeholders and my internal customers so that I can deliver to them what they're looking for. A great place to start here is by going out and talking to those stakeholders. Um, for the executive levels, set up meetings, um, conduct interviews with them, and, and ask open questions. You know, what are you looking for? Where have we not succeeded in the past? Um, what have we done well? What do you want to see us do better? Ask those detailed um, or open questions to get detailed answers out of the executive. For management level and individuals, uh, we've seen things like online surveys, so sending out um, a, a survey monkey or a Qualtrics, um, whatever you have, and asking maybe a few questions, something like, um, you know, on the previous screen, we listed out some of the possible services. Um, send them a list of possible services. Have them rank what's most important to you. Um, maybe an open, open format question, what have we done poorly? Um, what are you looking to see us improve on? So going out to the, to the stakeholders you have and, and understanding what's important. So with the, the surveys, too, you always have the option to follow up with people. Maybe you know, you've got a couple folks in, in a specific business line that's been really unhappy. Follow up with them, see what's important, um, and then use that to, to kind of define where you go in the next phase. Here's another example. Develop reporting capabilities around the needs of stakeholders. 
So you can kind of see uh, there's, there's four different um, stakeholder groups here, shareholders, staff, suppliers, and customers. Um, what we're trying to show you here is the importance of, of making a unique dashboard for each of those folks. Um, if, if reporting is important to them, they want to be able to have their own dashboard with metrics that are relevant to them, um, something that's, you know, that's going to um, help them with their specific business or something that they can take to, um, take to their executives to you know, make decisions and, and move forward. All right. The next step, define the details of procurement's brand management strategy, including processes and guiding principles. So this is the stage where you have collected all of that information uh, from your stakeholders. You know what they're looking for, and now you can start sort of putting things down on paper and defining what that new role of procurement is going to be. So the first one, and this one's a very important one, develop a simple, direct vision and guiding principles for procurement. And we'll show a couple of examples of these later. Um, but here you are, you're sort of creating your elevator pitch. Um, a one-pager to sort of explain what procurement is, um, what it isn't, and, and what your intentions are to um, provide services to the organization. Clearly define the business segments and departments that procurement can support. Um, so that one's self-explanatory. You are kind of setting boundaries and saying, here's what we can support, here's what we can't support. Um, next one, define the support services to be provided. Um, so you know, as you've defined which business segments you're supporting, um, you're also defining exactly what you can do for them. Then you're aligning your existing staff so that they can support all of these services and providing clear definitions of, of what staff is responsible for and how they're going to carry out each of these activities. Okay, um, so talking more about the staff and aligning them to support this, this new role of procurement, here we can see how a dedicated business liaison can benefit the organization. Um, this, is, this chart's a little bit difficult to read, so I'll explain it. Um, we've got peer on the left and world class on the right, and on the bottom you have low, medium, and high. And that indicates um, how um, prevalent the dedicated business liaisons are. So you can see with peer organizations, it's, you know, they have a sort of medium, maybe high, um, uh, appearance of these roles. And then if you look at world class, most of your world class organizations um, have these dedicated business liaisons in place. Um, and this is a really important role to have. We've, we've spoken with you know, many of our clients that have had a lot of success getting this role into place. Um, they're there to sort of help procurement get a seat at the table with those businesses. Um, they, they get you involved earlier in the, in the sourcing process um, and really just kind of open up the lines of communication between procurement and the business to enable both of the organizations to work together um, in a more productive manner. Okay. Uh, develop a vision for the organization. So these are just a few examples of vision and mission statements. You can see on the first one there, it's a, it's a nice example of something that's very concise. Um, you've got the procurement logo showing. You have a you know, two-line vision, a two-line mission statement, um, and a couple of the, you know, the fundamental principles of the organization. So this is the kind of thing that you're looking for, something that's simple, but it describes exactly what procurement, um, procurement's goal is for for the organization. Okay, so the next step is create marketing materials and release initial communications. This is where you start interacting with stakeholders. So you're developing an identity here. Um, maybe come up with a new name for procurement. 
Um, Ben Smart is a name that um, we've actually seen with, with multiple clients. Something that's kind of short, um, it's catchy, it's easy to remember, um, and, and you don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to call yourselves just procurement. You can get creative here. So you're also making a logo, um, branding that mission and vision statement that we saw in the, the previous slide. So you're starting to get the creative, um, creative aspects of the brand work in this stage. Um, you're also uh, determining communication methods with stakeholders. So on your portal, do you have a phone number listed that goes to a central line? Do you have email support? One of the other things we've seen that uh, is a really great idea is setting up a physical buy desk. So at the corporate headquarters, they have a physical procurement buy desk. And procurement kind of rotates over who, who's kind of running the desk. So an executive can come over and say, um, you know, I, I, my phone's broken. I need a new phone. So you, know, you can buy them a new phone. Um, whatever it is that might work for, for your organization, um, but they've got a, a person there physically standing there face-to-face -face so that if things get difficult, maybe over email communication or whatever it is, they can walk up and ask procurement a question. Um, so that, that was a really great way of, of kind of connecting procurement with, with the customer. Um, another one, deploy an internal intranet site. So having that portal available for stakeholders to log in and you'll have a, you know, a dashboard of here's everything that procurement can offer. Here's where to go for, you know, here's where to find your catalog. Here's where to find, um, you know, email support. You've got all of that information on one central um, intranet site available to all stakeholders. You can access reporting there. Um, someone can log in and maybe even go to their personalized um, dashboard to see up-to-date uh, metrics. Lots of things that you can do with that, but you know, the most important thing is that you have it. Develop marketing materials for various audiences um, consistent with overall messaging. Um, so here you want to make sure that you have um, branded uh, PowerPoint templates. You have, if you're sending out a newsletter, you have a, a branded newsletter and it, you know, it looks consistent. It looks the same every week or month or whenever you're sending it out so that stakeholders, again, they're identifying. They, you know, they get, they can understand the, the consistency of procurement and they know that when they reach out to procurement, they're going to get the same service every time. Okay. Um, just a couple of logos here for, um, again, not procurement organizations, but these are just um, you know, your, your standard company logos. Uh, the takeaway here, though, is that, you know, well, there's two takeaways. So the first one is if you work for, you know, if, if you're Baskin-Robbins procurement, then you probably don't want to have a logo that's red and green and aerial font, right? You want to have something that looks similarly branded to the Baskin-Robbins um, logo. And someone actually pointed out last time we did this, uh, this slide that in the middle of the Baskin-Robbins logo, you can see 31. It's pink. That's actually a, a hidden message because they're also called 31 flavors. So, you know, they got a little creative and unique in the logo. So the important thing is to do something that's simple and it takes advantage of the brand that already exists for your enterprise organization. Um, so like I said before, we're not recreating the wheel. We're just sort of fine-tuning the branding for the procurement organization. Um, but like you can see in all these, you know, get creative too and let the personality of, of procurement employees in because ultimately they're the ones that are, um, you know, you're branding the capabilities and the people here. 
Um, design templates, we talked a little bit about these too. So make sure that you have uh, just a simple set of brand guidelines. You've got a color palette, fonts, um, all those typical things that you would see in a, you know, in a PowerPoint template. Um, make sure that you have specific ones for procurement. So again, what we're doing here is we're creating consistency and we're developing um, you know, a, a brand that will resonate with stakeholders. Um, so every time they see that logo or you know, they see your, your, your standard PowerPoint templates, they know what they're going to get and they're comfortable with the, with the procurement organization. Okay, and the last step, engage and communicate with all stakeholders on a long-term basis. So once you've done steps one through three, um, you know, you, you understand your, your customer, you've defined what procurement's going to be, and then you've launched those initial marketing communications. So here it's important to understand that this is an ongoing effort. You don't just launch a brand, uh, a brand once and then call it done. This is something that you want to do every day. So are you um, sending out email distribution? So one that's really popular is to send out newsletters. Um, what kind of face-to-face -face engagement are you doing? Um, is it road shows to business executives, um, road shows to middle management and operations? Are you doing monthly or, or quarterly calls? What's the, what's the cadence for all of these ways to engage with stakeholders? metrics you can see in the bottom there. Um, you know, how, how is data available to stakeholders? Is it available on demand in a portal? Or are you sending out a quarterly dashboard? Um, figure out the way that you want to engage and, and make sure that it's a, a regular and very consistent process. Okay, um, here you can see just uh, an example of of a newsletter, um, something that might be included in a newsletter. Um, typically what we would see here is to include, you know, what's changed in procurement, what are any new policies, uh, maybe reminders of policies that aren't typically adhered to, and then including something like a case study or an employee spotlight. Doing the employee spotlights are, are, are really um, a good way to keep employees engaged a way to connect procurement with the stakeholders. Um, those are a really positive and kind of fun thing that you can do um, to add on to a newsletter. All right, uh, make data easily accessible for stakeholders. Um, so you can see um, here are some examples from, from Zykus. Um, again, these are, these are just great ways to get your, um, get stakeholders kind of involved. Um, this makes them very, very happy to have that access to data. Um, it's something that people are always looking for and for people to kind of self-service and, and get data themselves um, is a, a very productive thing when done right. Okay, um, so selling the brand internally. We talked about those steps one through four. Um, this is kind of a, an underlying principle. So it's very important to get your team on board. Um, and this is not something that you would do as one of those steps in the process. This is something that you should be thinking about all the time. Um, so choose your moment, select an appropriate time to launch a new procurement brand. So before you get started with any of this, make sure that it's the right time. Make sure that employees are on board. Um, make sure that you know maybe you're not about to undergo a leadership change. Um, this is a great thing to do right following a lead leadership change. Number two, link to external marketing. We talked about this a little bit already. Um, matching the procurement marketing and branding to the um, enterprise or external marketing so that you aren't um, creating any, any conflicting ideas and you're kind of just piggybacking on what the larger organization has already done. Then number three, bring the brand alive. Connect with employees on a personal level. And to talk about this one, we'll just give one example. So Coca-Cola, I think everyone probably remembers this, um, when they launched their Share a Coke campaign. Um, it, it's still out there where you can 
go and get your bottle of Coca-Cola, and it'll say, you know, share a Coke with Flora. And I can find one with my own name on it. Um, I can, you know, go get one made. Or maybe it says, you know, share a Coke with your sister. Um, so this was a, a great way that Coca-Cola kind of connected with its customers. But what they also did um, in Europe, they sent about 800 employees out as brand ambassadors to meet and engage with customers. So it's this idea of a brand ambassador that we want to take and apply it to procurement. So like I talked about with, um, with that, the physical um, procurement service desk, right? So you're using procurement employees where this isn't, you know, may not be their full-time job, but you've given them an accountability to connect with the customers. So that helps procurement employees feel like they're very engaged. They feel connected and accountable. Um, so it's this idea of a brand ambassador. Um, our clients have had great experiences with this, um, and it, you know, it's all about getting those people involved. Um, we've talked about millennials a lot, too, in the past couple of years, and how they're sort of changing the way that we do business. This is the kind of thing that can really help them get engaged and, and feel like they're part of, you know, part of the, the higher level goals here, and really part of the organization, crucial to its, its success. Um, okay, so now I'm going to hand it back and we're going to do a case study. Yes, thanks so much, Laura. Lots of great ideas and examples, and uh, <clears throat> certainly enjoyed the last one, sharing a Coke. We like to, to share a Coke with Coca-Cola Company, uh, actually one of the Zykus uh, customers. And, and I want to share a mini case study with another customer, Carlson Residor Hotel Group. And we'll call it upgrading to the suite, because after all, this is a, a hotel company. And uh, really talk about their journey to source to pay transformation and how branding as well as technology are part and parcel of that journey at the Carlson Residor Hotel Group. And a little bit about them uh, just by way of background, first and foremost, number one, we're talking about branding. And they actually have multiple recognizable global brands. So kind of branding is, is part of the DNA there. And as frequent business travelers, we've probably all enjoyed opportunities to stay at a, a Radisson or a Country Inn and Suites uh, at, or any of the other brands and properties around the globe that actually encompass uh, 1,400 hotels in 115 countries. So it makes them, in fact, one of the world's largest hotel companies. I want to talk then a little bit about what were some of the unique challenges, uh, more from an organizational standpoint first and then follow up uh, more specifically in procurement, but just the fact that the the company um, does encompass so many different brands uh, does have implications for procurement. Uh, one, that uh, those different brand companies uh, have different policies and procedures unique, unique to each, and therefore in deploying a technology, procurement technology like Procure to Pay, for example, means being able to partition and set up different unique catalog views specific to to a brand or or different user access and control. So that's one challenge to deal with. The second is the user base itself is extremely diverse, uh, including uh, many different functional roles that are non-procurement users. So if you think about a hotel operation, you have not only the corporate function, sort of corporate management and franchise ownership, but at the local property level, that hotel manager, the chef, someone on the front desk in housekeeping or facilities uh, might be someone who needs to requisition and place orders, for example, uh, you know, acting in, in that kind of a quasi-procurement role, but in fact, Obviously, their day jobs have really nothing to do specifically with procurement. And the third area that I'll mention as a sort of a unique challenge here is 
in in this hotel business, they actually have a combination of both owned and franchised properties. So it is, in fact, multi-enterprise. Those franchisees are separate companies that have their own unique requirements with regard to procurement processes, things like unique approval processes on the back end, of course, those external entities, the franchisees, have their own back-end systems and a separate P&L and chart of accounts. So lots of challenges from an organizational standpoint. Specific to the procurement operation at, at Carlson Residor, um, their journey is really about migrating from sort of a legacy siloed type operation to an integrated suite approach. So. Looking back, um, sort of the, the as-is state was, was a siloed operation that had islands of automation, had an existing homegrown e-procurement tool in place with the Residor Hotel Group, which operates the brands in Europe. But being a custom homegrown developed system, it had a number of unique features specific to the hotel industry but it was difficult to maintain and support and didn't necessarily have state-of-the-art user-friendly capabilities around searching, filtering, and, and managing uh, PO catalog content. And across the board, it was lack, uh, there was a lack of a standard approval workflow approach. Being a very global operation, the system did not support globalization features, multilingual, multi-currency. And owing to the fact that the, the existing infrastructure was very disparate and disjointed, it was very difficult to create that single version of the truth when it comes to understanding what's going on with a given supplier or category, as an example. So the goal here was to put in place an integrated suite approach that spans the source-to-pay process continuum and to deploy a SaaS, a software as a service solution that drives faster enhancements and upgrades, produces that consolidated visibility into suppliers and data governance, but also has the flexibility to globalize and localize as appropriate and as required. So different users in different parts of the globe and maybe with within different brands or even different entities when it comes to franchisees have the ability to localize their application to, to local language and currency, but also to adapt to the different nuances from a process standpoint, a you know, specific uh, process workflow and having that be very configurable, all of which points towards an end-to-end -end transparent and globally visible process. So I'll talk a little bit about how Carlson Residor went about this and, and how branding plays in as well. As, as we look across the, the source to pay suite, um, one of the things that Carlson did was actually deployed in their first phase uh, what we call the upstream components, more of the strategic sourcing tools, spend analytics, e-sourcing, uh, contract management, those kinds of tools really to get their own house in order, so to speak, make sure that the sourcing, the procurement function, you know, has best of breed tools, is really capable of delivering best in class results, have that groundwork laid in the first instance, but recognize also that it, those components tend to be less visible to end users. They don't necessarily understand all the nuances around how category managers go about analyzing spend, developing category and sourcing strategies and driving those through to fruition. But in phase two, they deployed procure to pay on a global basis. And that, in fact, is an area in the, the procurement suite that is extremely visible across the enterprise to various end users and stakeholders and has a major impact on the procurement brand. So in launching that phase two around procure to pay, you see some of the statistics here included after just a few months. Um, and, and I think one of the things that's really significant here is that while ramping to several thousand users globally, uh, Carlson paid particular attention to making sure that 
that brand image gets reinforced from a content standpoint. So before they ramped a critical mass of users, they made sure that there was a critical mass of content available in their procure to page tool. So 254 catalogs in the initial phase, in fact, more catalogs than users. So the critical component there is when users log into a tool like procure to pay their image of that brand is going to be based to a large extent on was I able to find what I was looking for. It's really a moment of truth for those users. So really a best practice here was to make sure that when they did the initial launch at Go Live, that those users that were included in the first tranche of users that got onboarded were sure to find what they needed and that it was easy for them to find the product or service because that's going to reinforce their image of that brand and keep them coming back. And, and they also paid particular attention to make, making sure that in the initial deployment that support was there for that localization that I mentioned, that there was, in fact, separate partition instances included for franchisees with unique approval workflows, business rules, and templates. And likewise, that that configurability extended to the different brands. If you're a, a user within the, the Radisson group or the, or the Country Inn and Suites or the Park Inn as an example. So you have that ability to adapt to the different user base constituencies, if you will, to make it more usable, to, to, to make sure that that brand resonates but then you have the ability to roll up all this. So you've got consolidated spend visibility in a global taxonomy that produces the kind of uh, global sourcing leverage and spend aggregation capabilities that were key focus areas for the team at Carlson. So just to give you an idea about branding and how this plays in, um, rather than, and I think you, you mentioned it earlier, Laura, give the procurement department or, or the, the technology initiative in this case, a unique kind of a brand name that's short and catchy and, you know, easy to recall. And in this case, um, their instance of the procure-to-pay procure, procure to pay application at Carlson is branded as SHOP. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the acronym actually does stand for something that, uh, along the lines of, you know, standard hotel ordering process, but more importantly, shop is descriptive in and of itself. That's what peop, that's what requisitioners think about when they log into the procure-to-pay tool, the e-procurement uh, application, is I'm going online to shop. And of course, uh, the, the logo is, is fairly small here in the upper left-hand corner, but at the landing page, they'd have a much bigger image of, of the shop brand logo along with a shopping cart, which is also very descriptive of, of what the, the purpose is of the application. And once they log in, the personalization uh, identifies that me as a user from Carlson in, in EMEA, uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, so high Carlson, EMEA is in the upper right-hand quadrant. Uh, more importantly, perhaps, once I log in, my view of suppliers and catalogs is personalized to me. So you see, for instance, various punch outs listed here that are specific to the European uh, market region. So that as a user, I feel like I'm not going to some foreign kind of a third party website. It, it's a it's a web page that's branded with my logo, my company logo, my color scheme, and I, it knows who I am as a user within the organization. It presents to me content that's specific to my particular role in the organization as well. So all ways in which the branding focus has been incorporated here. And I'll just share with you some of the takeaways in terms of the insights and some of the innovation that's been driven at Carlson, and number one, specific to branding, that branding the solution has really enabled them to drive adoption across multiple hotel brands and franchisees. So you've got all these different entities, but they're all recognizing that they're part of a much broader initiative, a, you know, a collective 
whole that's uh, focused on, uh, you know, shopping uh, with, with, with the brand and the logo for shop. The other key component here is, especially in this type of an environment where there, is, where there are external enterprises, franchisees, the brand image helps reinforce the value that's being delivered uh, through the franchise and actually serves as a way to, to generate, uh, you know, revenues to, fr from, the, from the service that's delivered to the franchisees that enable them to turn it from a, you know, a cost-neutral type of a program to actually a profit center going forward. And specific to the usability of the application, they really focused on not just the simple basic catalog line items, but being able to drill down to specs on all types of product or services, making sure they have the right item and the right price for all types of expenditures, whether those are you know, stationary supplies or, or for the kitchen or for, or for the, 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 the housekeeping clue with, crew, whether they're cleaning supplies, making sure that they have that real one-stop shop when they come to the shop uh, webpage uh, that's going to, again, reinforce the brand value and usability to end users. Now, a couple of other things they discovered. In some cases, they're, they're going, going back to complete what are called retroactive purchases. So every organization has the dreaded um, no PO invoice that shows up from time to time, but by documenting those incidences, they're really driving towards much more effective control on the front end to reduce the occurrences of, uh, of actually having a, an invoice created without a purchase order going through the, the, the uh, you know, approved procure-to-pay process. And likewise, they continue to innovate around things like uh, a, a requisition to quote process. So when an, when an item's not available on a current catalog or contract, being able to quickly turn that end user's request into a request for quote and then update um, the shopping cart to place the order in a seamless transaction when it's required that they get a, a quote on, on the front end as well. So that's just a quick case study specific to Carlson Residor and how they've adopted some of these branding techniques in conjunction with a source to pay technology transformation. So let me turn it back to you, Laura. Great, thank you. All right. So we are going to do one more poll. All right, if we can get the poll loaded up. The last question is, by improving awareness of procurement's offerings through rebranding, how do you estimate the percentage of spend influence would increase? So better awareness would not impact spend influence, Spend influence would increase by 5 to 10 percent, 11 to 20 percent, 21 to 30 percent, or you think it might increase by more than 30 percent. So go ahead and select which option. Obviously, this is just a guess. We're taking kind of educated guess at what you think would happen here, but really what we're trying to do is, is better help quantify the effects of rebranding. And Laura, would you guess in this case there might be sort of a, a normal distribution across these yeah. ranges, but but that you know even if it let's say it's only a, more of an incremental gain, five to ten percent, five to ten percent spend influence would I, I would think still be a very material impact in terms of the the bottom line and return on investment. Uh, you know, that, that procurement can, can deliver. Yeah, I mean, we'll usually see pretty pretty few selections of the no impact. We're, we're typically seeing some type of increase here, which, um, you know, whatever it might be, it, it's, still a, it's still a material number. And, um, you know, of course, something that procurement's always looking to do is to increase that spend influence so yeah, so the results are here. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the respondents can see the results as well, but I'll go ahead and kind of cover them again. So 37% said 
spend influence would increase by 5 to 10 percent. 34 percent says it would increase by 11 to 20 percent. So the majority of results are kind of in this middle bucket, um, 5 to 20 percent, um, which is, you know, a, a very reasonable increase of spend influence. And then about 18 percent said it would increase by more than 20 percent. And 8% said they don't believe it would impact spending. So, okay, that's, uh, that's again, about what we would expect. So we're, we're typically seeing some sort of increase here. All right, so we'll wrap up now. Uh, I just want to kind of cover the steps that we talked about for rebranding. So your steps one through four, understand the key areas of importance for internal customers, so you're understanding what their needs are. Number two, define processes and details of procurement's new role. So you're taking what's important to your customers and reshaping procurement to help deliver um, those needs for them. Three, create marketing materials and release initial communications. So you've defined what procurement can offer. Now we are creating marketing materials and starting to interact and communicate with stakeholders so that they know what procurement can offer them and they can take advantage of those services. And number four, engage and communicate with all stakeholders regularly. So you're kind of turning this into a well-oiled machine. You're ensuring that the lines of communication um, continue to stay open between procurement and stakeholders. And then on the bottom there, you've got internal buy-in. So always remember how important it is that procurement employees are engaged. Um, it, they are the ones that are, you know, are, are doing all of procurement's work, so it's important to keep them engaged, keep them accountable, and make procurement an organization that they can get on board with and something that they're behind. Um, that's ultimately going to elevate everything that procurement is delivering. And I believe that concludes our webinar for the day. Yeah, that's that. That's the uh, the end of the content portion. Thank you so much for that, Laura. Terrific, uh, terrific content and insights there. And uh, we did have some questions along the way, particularly about getting access to this content. So let me just reiterate that uh, within 24 hours. Uh, uh, of this moment, uh, we'll be sending out an email to all the, the attendees that will give you a link to the webinar recording as well as the presentation, the slide deck, and the, the continuing education uh, credit as well. And with that, I'd like to, uh, again, thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for attending. and. Uh, Please uh, look for, for that email to get the, the information in the slide deck uh, included. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining today's webinar. Great. Thank you, everyone.